Come on. What an amazing day, my friends, it is to be alive. Super pumped to be with you. I know that we are extremely late. <laughs> we're extremely late for the folks who think that, oh, we're on, you know, let's say, mm, I don't know, at 10. Uh, you haven't been paying attention. You gotta watch the show more. Why? Because I told you I was gonna be going to 11. And then I went to 11.30. <laughs> but there's a reason why. My kids are home. My kids are home, COVID restrictions, because come to find out, when your boy went and did the speech about enthusiasm to the Inquisitors, right? And they were sharp. They were on the ball. Kept your boy on his heels. It was awesome. But there was a guy there, and he had himself some COVID. <laughs> he had himself some COVID. Oh, man. And come to find out, said, look, he went in, got tested. Oh, my gosh, she's contagious. And they said, anyone who's been in any kind of close proximity, and I thought about it. I thought about it, and I thought, was I in close proximity? Sure, maybe I sat near him. Sure, maybe we were in the exact same room. Sure, maybe I shook his hand and gave him a hug. And maybe we dipped our hands into the same bowl of amazing shrimp. But I don't know. I had to think about it. And at the end of the day, yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And so my kids were with me, two of them. My son Athanasius is real ticked right now. He's real mad. He's like, I wish I would have gone to the speech. And I'm like, I told you to go. <laughs> People say, well, why is that? Because now he's the only kid that has to be going, you know, to school and such. <laughs> and he's not happy about that. Oh, he's not happy about it. He's pretty ticked off. So, all right. I'll tell you what, super pumped right now. It's the Wednesday, November 17th edition. Paleo Crad Diary is right here on Meaning of Catholic. Ah, oh, we got a good show for you today. I don't want to spend forever in a Chinese New Year talking about, you know, introductory remarks and all of that jazz. I don't want to do that. You know, I do it all the time. It's a it's a habit of mine. It's a habit. We're going to go ahead. Let me show you this real quick. We're going to we're just going to go through these. So check it out. You've got to go, please. <laughs> do yourself a favor. Go and join Paleocrat Diaries over at the Wolfpack chat over on Telegram, free app. It's an amazing thing. Yesterday, it was awesome. It was the conversations that we have range from just silly and hilarious all the way to like deeply heartfelt, you're going to make your boy cry kind of stuff, you know, and living, learning, loving, and laughing all the while. It's what we do. But it was so, it was, it, one thing, I, I just got to stress this because we did it last night, right? It was actually a late night prayer. We did a, um, the Little Flower Chaplet, kind of a version of that, where you go through and you're doing the glory of Patri, right? You're doing that. And uh, on each bead, we would, we would put out a request, right? One of, the, one of the requests that's been submitted to the Wolfpack, because we have a prayer group right there, right? The prayer chain. So we've got, let me, let me see if I can go ahead and just get this. Go oh, all right. Well, I guess I accidentally did that. I didn't mean to do that. So, okay, yeah, check it out. So if I go to the prayer chain... Okay, you're going to see, right, family in crisis, right, people who, uh, two of my neighbors, you got different prayers that are being posted, you got different saints, you got prayers for the day in there, and we keep a list, in fact, let me see if I can scroll up big enough to see it, and by the way, thank you everybody for, for the, the prayer symbols, a lot of those have to do with the idea that, um, you know, we, family staying home with COVID stuff, look at this, right here, this is what it is, right here, I just got I got to scroll, you see all these words on the screen, those are prayer requests. We ain't messing around. Okay? Start at one. Look at this. All the way down. You just keep going. Our, our admin, Haley, she's in, the co she's in the comments here. She's the moderator here. And she puts this together. She keeps track of this. Okay? So you can post it in the Wolfpack chat. Doesn't matter where you send it. Ends up getting here. We got up yesterday 66 prayer requests. And then we added a couple that were uh, found later on that weren't added to that list. We're like about 70 different prayer requests right now, right? That people have reached out to us and we actually pray for them. We pray for them and it's on, it's on record. We're going to, I'll share the video uh, at the Wolfpack chat later today after the show, but we record it. So we, we record it. You have people in there. They help take part. So I might do the first part of the, the glory be. They do the, the second part or the first part of the Hail Mary. They do the second part or we're reading uh, different passages from Imitation of Christ, and then somebody like Phil, he'll read uh, from the, the scripture reading for that day. 
and all that. So different people, they, they contribute as well. Yesterday, Veronica did the second part. She's the, she's the admin over at the book club. Speaking of the book club, there it is. Okay, we actually, we have a, a meeting coming up on Saturday. It's the second meeting. Uh, and I, I believe it's, uh, how many, what, what chapters would it be? Would it be four through 10, I think, of, uh, of Interior Castle? I think it's six chapters. Um, and so the thing is, is that that's over a two-week period of time. But then we get together and we have, we have an actual chat. You can watch the video there. And people share, of course, their, their thoughts and reflections throughout the week and stuff like that. But you just, you have to do it. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm being really serious about this. Like, this is something that, yes, it's a lot of fun. You can see we share memes with each other and stuff. But we also share, you know, yeah, she's shoving it in our face, right, about dictionaries. And, and she's, she's our Brit bot. She's from Britain. Right? But, I mean, we had, we had conversations last night that were just, that were just awesome. They were just powerful about what we're doing. It was just something that somebody said. I don't even know. Let me see if it's, let me see if it's in here. Let me see if it's in here. All right? Okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to say this. This is what I'm going to say. Okay? And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take the, the telegram off the screen to, to say, because I want to, I just want to read it to you. Okay? I wrote this. I love the Wolfpack chat. And I'm not, I'm going to try really hard not to get emotional, because you guys just don't know how much you mean to me, actually. You know what? No, you do. I think, I think you do. I think you know, and I think you know that, that, you know, we mean as much to you. You're there every day. You're, you're the average Joe. We, we, we don't even call them that. What do we call them? We say Johnny Q and Sally Sue. It's what we say. It's what we say. The Johnny Q and the Sally Sues of the world. So many of us, just everyday people, everyday Catholic people trying to make a living, trying to raise a family, trying to live as godly as we can in a really, really wicked world. And I said, I love the Wolfpack chat. I'm proud of who we are and what we do. It's true, we're freaks and geeks. We're Johnny Q's and Sally Sue's. But so what? We're loving God, church, family, friends. Heck, I'm even learning to love my enemies. Are you? We have fun, no doubt, sharing gifts and memes, extremely rude and inconsiderate stickers that mock the tender-hearted lion that we lovingly refer to as the Kaiser, bless his heart. <laughs> But, but we're learning from saints. We're learning from beloved priests. We're fortifying our faith in crazy, wicked times. And we're actually praying for each other. It's not, we're not doing the thoughts and prayers, man, thoughts and prayers, and walking on with our life. We're not seeing a prayer request for someone with, with a brain tumor or prayer request for somebody who's fallen away or prayer request for a child who's dying or prayer request for the end of abortion and pushing the little like button and moving on to the next meme. We're praying for that. We're praying for each other. Every day, people are, people are praying for the wolf pack, for each other to say, look, you're in it with me, we're in it together. And we're praying for people we've never even met. I've been through some crazy junk, right? We all have. And there have been times that I felt really alone, like I was drowning in despair. And I still struggle with things. I still get grumpy and I still mess up. But I know that I know that I know that all of you, all of you guys, and of course those girls at the Ex girls uh, exclusively for the ladies Luna uh, the Luna pack okay and you can find that you can if you're in there and you want to be with only the ladies there's no men allowed I tried I rolled in there one time <laughs> I'm like I'm like how, how can I not be part of that group I'm the you know I'm the the grand poobah here of you know the paleocrat society essentially but it's for the ladies and I know that you are here for me, my family, meaning of Catholic, reason and theology, and for each other. And I know it can sound really cliche, right? We've heard it a bazillion times that we're in this together, but we're not joking about that. We are not messing around about that. People talk about fraternity. People talk about community all day long. We are actually doing that. If you're somebody who says, man, I feel so isolated and alone. I, I don't really have people to talk to. You need to make a, a very simple decision. If you have a smartphone, delete, delete some of your apps and replace it with this one. I'm, I'm dead serious about it. I'm dead serious. 
Go to that app. Go to Telegram. Find the Wolfpack chat. It's just simple. It's all one word. The Wolfpack chat. But we're in this together. We put it into practice every single day. And just to think, it isn't only us or even those we know, but all of those people that we come in contact with who find themselves in trouble, who are struggling with their lives, who need help, or maybe they just simply want somebody to pray for them. And you just want to know that when somebody tells them that they'll pray for them, that they really will. I challenge you, find out if we're really doing that. Find out, and I'll tell you, it's easy because we share the videos of it. We share the videos of it, and you can see the people responding to it. You can see the people bringing up prayers and saying how, how much it's benefited them, not only to pray for other people, but to know that they're praying for them in return. It's true. And here's the crazy thing. Here's the crazy thing, is that we have so many prayer requests at this point that sometimes it actually is kind of hard to keep count. And, lest everybody need a reminder, all of that's true at a wolf pack at only 149 members. So I'm really serious, deadly serious, when I say that I am proud of this ragtag group of freaks and geeks. You are all amazing to me. The only thing I ask is that you just never stop being you. Because I love you guys, for realsies. <laughs> for realsies, I'm so proud. I'm so proud. And so just make sure, again, let me go ahead and, and take that. Yeah, I think I, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and take this off. I don't need to go back to the Wolfpack chat or anything like that. And make sure, of course, go to, uh, you know, I'll, I'll show it because he's way behind. <laughs> he's way behind. We got we to show this real quick. Let's see. Reason and theology. Okay. Reason and theology fans, you got to make sure. Okay. I think I was the first person. I, I helped him set it up. So <laughs> I, I helped him set up this stuff behind the scenes. I was working behind the scenes. Same thing, same thing with Flanders. Okay. So you got to make sure. Go over. If you love reason and theology, uh, make sure to do that. And if you're a, a patron over at Meaning of Catholic, do not forget that they have a Telegram guild for people. He, sh he should, in my opinion, he should have a public chat as well, just for everybody. Um, but the guild, as it is right now, those are that's a, a patron exclusive option. So if you're a patron, make sure to do that. But go over reason and theology fans. Simply put, simply put. Okay. So you just got to go check it out right now. You got to do it. You got to do it. So all right, I'm gonna go ahead and get that out here. I'm gonna go ahead and take that off. Okay. Now. I want to share a quick video, and then we're going to do the, the uh, Saint Maker. And then as soon as we're done with Saint Maker, we're getting right into Father Lassant. Okay, we're going to just, just go <laughs> pedal to the metal. That's what we're going to do. We're going pedal to the metal, okay? And uh, once we do that, I think, I think that's where I would be able to do the... Um, is that where I would do, let's see, Telegram. Where, where did I just have that? Okay, yeah. So it'd be on the second, the second page that I will have the YouTube comments and stuff. We'll, I'll mention those. Here in a little bit, I just want to tell everybody, I see you over there. We'll, it will pop you up on the screen here in the next frame. That'll be after this video and then the Saint Maker ad, and then we'll get right to it. So, But before that, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to the folks over at Tridentine Brewing Company again. You know, I, I'm all out of the beer for now. For now, I'm out of the beer. So no more mornings with beer for me. <laughs> no more of that. That was a lot of fun, though. Um, not, not, for a few, not for a little bit, but I've got a really cool... A really cool uh, gift a little package of prizes here but i wanted to share this video because it's again another prayer request and it's the kind of thing that we do here not only for the show but we do um as a wolf pack and so it's another one of those wolf pack chat things this was shared there if this is the kind of thing you like to see and the kind of thing you like to hear about and you'd like to be part of it again remember make sure to go over to the wolf pack chat but real quick i'm going to show you this video that we made it's about seven minutes so if you haven't gotten your coffee Make sure to crank this bad boy up so you, you, don't, you want to be able to at least hear it. You want to be able to at least hear it. So crank it up. Enjoy yourself. Go get your coffee. Make sure to get the straw. As we've talked about, it bypasses. It allows the caffeine to bypass the blood-brain barrier straight to the dome. <laughs> Scientifically proven. Scientifically proven. So make sure to go get that, and we'll be right back right after this. Okay, guys, be quiet. We're recording. Yeah, we're recording to you. Stop hacking up along, Teresa. 
Why don't you control that cough? <laughs> so, yesterday, was it yesterday? Yes. I got a package in the mail, and I was going to open it, but then I realized what it was. And I thought it'd be even cooler if I waited to open it. And I didn't even realize that it, I had gotten a letter. And I won't read all of it, but I'll make it available. I'll take pictures of it and share it at the Wolfpack chat and on Patreon. Because it goes into the life and the death of Reverend Richard F. Costles. And you can see here. Get it up a little bit closer. Yeah. So it goes into his life a little bit. Um, and there's a reason why. So it says, in this box are also some magnets uh, that you can give out to patrons or members of the Wolfpack chat as you see fit. You brought up uh, that you might do this in a recent show. Yes, and I did this, actually. I gave some way to it, it, the speech I did on enthusiasm with the Inquisitors. So Trevor is one of the brewers over at the Tridentine Brewing Company. And you may have seen him, right? So if, if any time, if you see on Twitter, if you see uh, the Tridentine Brewing Company, or if you are on the Wolfpack chat and you see that, you're actually talking to Trevor Alcorn. And so he sent this to me, and he sent it on Veterans Day, which is especially cool. But he says, Dear Jeremiah, I am pleased to present these three books written by Monsignor Ronald Knox. Do I have, there are three, there are three books there? There are. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was just two really big ones. So yeah, okay, so three books written by Monsignor Ron Lentz that I was able to rescue from a dumpster. Specifically, it was a dumpster that I randomly came across in my town that was sitting outside a storage unit. Upon looking at the dumpster, I found out that the contents contained therein belonged to a recently deceased priest in our area, Father Richard Costles. Unfortunately, they, the storage company, his family, and the diocese, indiscriminately threw all of his possessions from the storage unit into a dumpster, including his entire sizable library. He was a priest of 69 years, so he had quite a collection of books. I have to say it was pretty gross and what, what they had done, right? At the same time, I was grateful to God that I had randomly walked past it with a few of my kids on a walk this past Sunday. It seemed to me to be a very clear sign that I should pray for the repose of Father Costal's soul. Another takeaway that I had from this was that we are not only all going to die someday, but that we will all be eventually forgotten by those here on earth. Here was a priest who had touched thousands of lives over the course of nearly 70 years of his ministry, and all of his possessions were simply being discarded and thrown away like common garbage. If someone such as this can be near instantly forgotten, what about the rest of us? So it's a fantastic yet poignant reminder that at all costs, we must put our eternal salvation as our number one priority in life so we can spend eternity with the Lord. The accolades and riches of this life mean nothing. If you could, please pray for the soul of Father Costas. Respectfully yours in Christ, Trevor Alcorn, Brewer, VP of Marketing, VP of IT, and Janitor over at Trinitine Brewing in Herschel, presently in Herschel, Illinois. Hersher, <laughs> Hersher, Illinois. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you. And, you know, that's one of my favorite, my favorite and least favorite things to ponder is how quickly the dead are forgotten. I know of this. And I, not just from experience, but also from St. Alphonsus in his uh, preparation for death, he talks about that and how kings that you wouldn't know sometimes if you opened up their grave that they lived a life of royalty and prestige. Because in the end, their bones are no different than the pauper. And so it's one of the reasons why I think it's okay to be Johnny Q. Sally Sue, too. So, all right. I got a bunch of magnets. I'll show these later. We won't go through each of these. I really want to get to the books. <laughs> I, I've been, they've been sitting there on, on the desk and I'm like, chopping at the bit to go ahead and get these books out. So we're going to see. Hold on. I don't want to. Okay, this is the one with two books. Okay, okay. So, first one here. Oh, man. Do you smell books, by the way? <laughs> Mama, do you ever smell books? 
Yeah, this is. Oh, there's underlining in it. <laughs> he was he was somebody who underlined books. Yes, he did. Okay, good, good, good. Yes, for Jeremiah Bannister, aka the Paleocrat, right? A retreat for priests. That's one. I can smell the books. What's that? I can smell the books. You can smell the books. I'm telling you, you can smell them from there. Yes, a New Testament commentary by Ronald Knox. Let's see what this one is. Let's see what this one is. A pastoral sermon of Ronald Knox. Well, I'll tell you, it's kind of crazy because I, Ronald Knox has changed my life dramatically, and yet the only books that I have by him, well, I have a book, I have Enthusiasm, and then I have uh, the Knox Bible. And I've got a nice, a nice copy of that. But nothing else. Nothing else by him. And it's tragic because he, he was such a great writer, one of the best, in fact, of the 20th century in, in English. And so, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. You know, and thank you also. Thank you also for, for this. Okay? It goes through his life. And, and just so people know, just so you know, i got to show this real quick, okay? Because he sent this right here. I don't know if you saw this on the chat, but check it out. See this? That's the dumpster. Okay, that's the dumpster that he found all the stuff in. If you go here, he has a couple more pictures. Let's see here. Urgh. Is there another one? Okay. This is something, by the way, that they found. And this really is disgusting. I mean, it, this is this. I, it's uncalled for. <laughs> In fact, it's inappropriate to do stuff like that. And, and there's our guy right here. Pray for him, too. Pray for the brewing company, right? They not only make good beer, they seem like amazing people. I'm excited to get down there. We're scheduling something, hopefully, for January, where they've even offered to allow me to, to put together ideas for a certain specific kind of beer and even come up with a name. And they'll maybe work with me with the art and stuff to find out, like, they got somebody who does that sort of thing and does the artwork for it. And uh, just, just all around awesome guy. So just make sure to keep him, of course, in your prayers. I know that he'd greatly appreciate it. Him and his family. It's a family endeavor. So Trevor Alcorn and the Alcorn guys and the Alcorn ladies and the Alcorn kids. <laughs> all of them. Pray for him. And thank you so much. I appreciate it more than you even know. And I love the way my house smells right now. God bless you, bud. All right. That was, you know, I'll tell you, I'm really grateful for those guys. I said we were going to do uh, the, the ad real quick, but I got a, I got a request. I, I shared something just for fun on the Wolfpack chat, and somebody said, dude, I didn't even know you did this sort of thing. And so I'm, I'm just letting everybody know this is an announcement. This is a big-time announcement that uh, we are going to be uh, making videos that are comedic, that are meant to be in, in just purely funny. They're not going to be, you know, there's not going to be mixed in with anything like Father Lassance or Secular Age or Enthusiasm, anything like that. Uh, strictly speaking, it's just going to be uh, funny videos. And I was kind of nervous to do it because Meaning of Catholic is, you know, kind of a serious outfit. <laughs> it's a serious endeavor, you know, and I'm already pushing boundaries left and right. And I thought, I don't know. I don't know if that's a good idea. And so I shared it on the on the Wolfpack chat, and people, they, they had no clue. Some people still were unaware. Some fans were still unaware of our family story. And, like, for example, like, what this shield behind me, what that is. What is Team Tiny Dancer? He talks about this thing, Team Tiny Dancer. What is that? They didn't realize that. Some people were still unaware that, I, that I'm a writer <laughs> and that I'm working on a book. Please pray for me. It's supposed to be due. In fact, I, I say supposed. It is due. Uh, by the end of December, and so please pray for me. Um, it's an emotional thing. I'm writing about the life and death of our daughter, Samantha. Uh, rest in peace. She died of childhood brain cancer. And and I'm talking about how that how that story um, ultimately led to our family returning to the Roman Catholic Church. And so it's a powerful story. Um, I'm really honored by the, the people who are willing to go through it for editing purposes and uh, and for publication purposes. But... With this, you know, I, I was kind of nervous, like, oh, my gosh, so, you know, I used to make these funny videos. Half the show used to just be really funny. The, the first half of the show was nothing but fun. That's all it was. And, and we would talk about viral videos and stuff. 
Here's an example of a short video that we're gonna we're gonna begin making these. These will be uh, exclusive over to Paleocrat Diaries or Paleocrat on YouTube, youtubecom slash Paleocrat. Although some folks are really hoping that I can I can begin doing some things like this over with Reason and Theology because they focus more on like comedic things and shorts and things like that. And so um, we're gonna start working on it. It's already been it's already been settled. It's already been settled. We're gonna do it. So I wanna it's gonna play for just a second. Okay, and then I'm gonna have to mute it. Okay, uh, can I can I drop that in there? No, I cannot. <laughs> Hold on, got to got to do media. Oh no, oh no. Where, where's the where's the the media media source? There we go. Okay, I'm gonna add this thing here. I'm gonna add the media source. For some reason, OBS hasn't been allowing me to uh, to drop things in like that. So we're gonna go ahead and let me see here. Let me see if this would be the one. I'm pretty sure it is. Psycho Seagull. Okay. Yep. So we're going to mute that for a second. Drop that down. Pull that up. Okay. And we're going to go ahead and play this. And then we're going to do the same maker ad. And as soon as we do that, we're ready to rock and roll. Okay. So I hope you enjoy this. It's, it's nothing but good fun. It's a, it's a true story. <laughs> In fact, it's a number of true stories. It's a lot of fun. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope you get a good laugh because we're going to get real serious here about the resurrection. And about uh, living through, you know, learning to laugh, learning to smile, learning to to have hope and, and good cheer, even in a valley of tears. That's what we're going to do. And in the shadow of death, right, when we approach that deathbed, whether it's ourselves or other people, to be of good cheer. And to, and to allow ourselves to weep, but not to be, not to be hysterical, right? To learn what it means to, to cry like a man, in fact, right? Or cry like a dignified lady, at the, like our lady at the foot of the cross, and stuff like that. And so it's a, it's going to be a really great time. So I'm going to play this. Thank you for your patience with it. I hope you enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. And uh, we're going to howl at the sun here in a minute. Here we go. Those are real. <laughs> Those are real, dude. <laughs> Picks fight with world champion boxer and win. Chantel Cameron thought Psycho Seagulls were a joke. No, they are not. No, they are not. They are not a joke. Believe you me. So the seagulls all up in her face. <laughs> Doing the thing, man. It's just like, yeah, like this. And then he what? Grabs the baguette. He's like, peace. <laughs> I'm out. What would you do in that situation? Would you fight it? Would you fight it with your bare hands? And be like, that's my baguette. Give me back my baguette. That's harder than money. People are watching you. Like, <laughs> right in the face of this freaking seagull. Teach that bugger a lesson. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's joking. They're like, stop joking. Stop joking the seagull. And you're like, you stole my baguette. I'm like, what? He stole my baguette. And they're like, you show him. And they jump in on it. They're punching the seagull. In the stomach. They're like, that's the same one that stole my beer. <laughs> the guy with the mullet, with the Michelob. So would you punch it though? <sighs> I would throw mud clods. And I say that because, oh, I don't know. In fact, I already have thrown mud clods at seagulls that were trying to attack me. It's true. It's true. In the Navy, I was out on a pier. I had an M60. I was totally rocking it out, feeling dope. By the way, M60s, uh, it's like smooth as silk. Oh, it's a love affair. So I'm out at the end of a pier. You got submarines on both sides of the pier. It's morning time. I'm third shift. So I'm making sure there's no terrorist bad guy coming into the base. I'm at the front lines. At the front lines. And all of a sudden, I hear this crazy noise. And I'm like, what the heck is going on, dude? I look up like this, and there's a seagull just <laughs> right in my face. Probably five feet from me. Oh, I was like, <laughs> dude, I booked it, man. It was this little, like, shanty kind of thing. I'm saying I book inside there, man. I'm hiding from that thing, dude. I'm shaking in my boots. I ain't gonna lie. And what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? And so it's not like if I saw a bad guy, you take care of business. <laughs> You're done. I could not get away with that with the seagull. They say, oh, you discharged your weapon. I'm like, bro, the seagull <laughs> was up on my junk. I had no idea what to do. I had no idea who to call. So I called the M60. <laughs> Come to find out, it was a mama seagull. And she had a nest on top of the shanty. <sighs> I had to tell the, the folks over at HQ, say, you got you to gotta come down and pick me up. I got to tell them 
something. <laughs> I didn't want to say it over to the comms because they didn't want everybody laughing at me. They come out and he's upset. What's going on, Banster? All of a sudden, whoo, right by his head, he's like, oh! I'm like, I told you, get in here. <laughs> we're both we're both inside peeking out. What is that? We grab these little mud clods, dude. We're just chucking them. We were mad, dude. We were mad. And by the time we got back, people had figured it out and they were laughing. Can a personal planner really make you a saint? Not by itself, but in our day and age of addictive apps and glowing screens, we're bombarded by constant distraction, and our quest for sainthood often takes a backseat. The Saint Maker is the first high-performance planner for the spiritual life made by faithful Catholics for faithful Catholics. It's a work of genius, really, fusing the wisdom of the saints with the science of personal productivity. It's rigorous, but sainthood is tough, and most of us need help organizing our time, our work, our leisure, and our devotion, because that can help you become a saint. The Saint Maker is elegant, fits in your purse or briefcase, and is a perfect companion for your missal, Bible, or rosary. Published four times per year, each season includes daily planning pages, feast days, and devotions for both forms of the liturgical calendar, goal-setting pages, confession journals, and more. It's why the Saint Maker is used by hardworking Catholics like CEO of Sock Religious Scott Williams, best-selling author Sam Guzman, YouTubers like Amber Schneider, a Catholic wife Dina Barca, and Brian Holdsworth, and priests like Father Corey Stitcher. Try the Saint Maker out, and if you decide that it's not for you, you can send it back for a full refund within 90 days. So go right now. Find your life planner at thesaintmaker.com. Quantities are limited, though. So head on over to thesaintmaker.com to order yours and to start your Saint Maker journey today. It's a life-changing thing. It's a beautiful thing. Comes out seasonally. Beautiful hardcovers. You got to do it. Saintmaker.com slash Paleocrat Diaries. All right, there's the sound. That's the sound. It's the alert system. It's the Paleocrat Diaries alert system. It's the alarm that sends out the message all across the globe that we are now about to enter the octagon of history. The fisticuffs are coming off, right? We're, we're ready to rock and roll. We've got this bugger in, in full gear. Pedal to the metal. It's what we're doing because we're dealing with ridiculous nonsense. This world, it's always been sinful, right? This world, it's why, it's why we have a savior. It's why we take a knee every single day. But things have just gone haywire completely bonker town and it's left so many people feeling despair unsure of what to do or how to deal they don't know they don't know what's coming they don't know how do we get here where are we now i need some kind of map i need some kind of guide i need some kind of key that will help me to break free from the chains of this modern world this secular age this, elect this internet age of electronic devices, glowing screens, the glitter and the glamour of profile pictures. <laughs> How do I break free? What do I do? And that's where we come in. We've said we're not only going to show you religiously some of the ways by which we got here. We did that in a 20-part video series on enthusiasm by Ronald Knox. We're doing that now. We've just started. We're, we've gone through, what, two or three episodes over at Reason and Theology, talking about secular age from looking at our world from a different dynamic. So you've got the kingdom of God, the schisms and the weirdness that goes on over there that led to some of the cuckoo nonsense we see now, but also the world, the kingdom of man, and say, how does this work out? How does this play out? What is the interplay between technologies and philosophies, devices, everything else? Advancements, things we thought were advancements, then lo and behold, there's blowback. But even that is insufficient. That's just a map. You need a key. You need a key. Part of that key is over at the uh, Canine Brigade, the book club at the Wolfpack Chat on Telegram, where we're talking about Interior Castle. The other part of that is this. And these, well, sorry, these. And these are the guides by Father Lassance. Ah, <sighs> super, super happy. And by the way, in the comments section, there's a lot of fake news going on. <laughs> Somebody said, is, is Jeremiah Bannister a Submariner? 
And somebody, I don't know, somebody named Angela said, yes, he is. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. And I wasn't. I never, I never got the old fins, man. Never, never, never. Uh, I was only I was only there for a short time, ended up getting a medical discharge. And so, sadly, you know, I tried to fight it, but, it, you know, it's kind of a hard deal when you're in a, in a military town like that, a Navy town. It's kind of hard, you know, because most of the lawyers there are JAG. <laughs> so they're like, we ain't going against the Navy. Are you serious? You know, you need to call the ACLU. And I'm like, no way. <laughs> what are you talking about? Why would I do that? <laughs> and so, so um, no, sadly, no. I did go through sub school. Okay, so I, I made it through the Navy. I was able in that proud moment after battle stations to remove that recruit cap. And I have a Navy cap now. And so, um, I, but I was stationed, I was stationed in Groton, Connecticut at the submarine base there. And I was going to sub school. I, I completed sub school and was in between sub school and A school and did not uh, make it through A school before I was given a medical discharge. Sadly, I loved the Navy. Uh, I have a lot of a lot of pride in that. Somebody asked me recently, you know, are you, are you patriotic? And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm as patriotic as I believe a Catholic can be in times like these. But I genuinely love this country. I love uh, the people. You know, I, I even with the criticisms that I have of the political economy or of even certain ideas of liberalism and rationalism that our country was founded upon and things like that, um, I was still willing to die for it because within this system, we're able to debate this out. We're able to give it our best to, to organize with each other, to work with each other, to, to make change in this society. And it's one of the things, you know, it, the debate, I don't know if you heard this, the debate that took place on Monday, uh, that was over liberalism on Meaning of Catholic. And we, it was uh, me and Kennedy Hall, the two of us, uh, debating with each other. Tim was moderating. It wasn't, wasn't formal. It's not like, hey, you have opening arguments and stuff like that. It was a dialogue. Right. But we, we have disagreements over liberalism and uh, over over libertarianism and things like that. And so we, we talked about it cordially. In fact, it was a bummer that it even stopped because after it was over, we, we talked in the green room right behind the scenes. Cameras off. No more recording. Nothing like that. And here we are just having a good old time. Right. Loving it. Having a good old time. Let me go over here real quick and just keep talking here in stage two. All right. Uh, actually, hold on. Let me see. if we, Do I have? My, can I do a oh, window capture? There we go. All right. So again, remember, if you want to, if you want to comment toward me, you got to go ahead and put that at symbol. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of letters on a screen. I won't be able to see the difference. See how see how it does it for meaning of Catholic right there. If you if you put at paleocrat or at me, well, put at meaning of Catholic. Uh, if you do that, you'll be able to. Uh, I'll be able to see it. So yeah, because I don't know if at paleocrat right now. I said at paleocrat on. Reason and theology, but that's because I'm not actually signed in to his channel. He sets it up for me, uh, and so I just I, I stream through there. But over here, if you put at meaning of Catholic, uh, you'll be I'll be able to see you there, and uh, and it'll stand out. So I'll be able to to deal with that. Um, but somebody asked, you know, am I <laughs> am I a submariner? No, I am not. Um, you know, but I I am a Navy veteran, right? I'm a Navy veteran, so uh, definitely. Um, I love the country, and it was it was an awesome it was an awesome conversation with Kennedy. And after it was over, after it was over, we uh we, we kept talking. It was a great time, and Kennedy's like, "Man, we should have just kept going. <laughs> we should have kept going because I think we talked for another 20, 25 minutes, and it was it was awesome. It was a great discussion, a great back and forth. But we'll be back on Monday to talk about the state, a nation, and government, and what are, what what how ought a Catholic to view those things. Are they the same thing? Does a nation require a state, right? Does government require a state? And what does the Catholic Church say about any of it? So we're going we're gonna to talk about that because we're coming from two totally different perspectives. He's, he's, he's begun embracing antistatism, right? Um, and I, I would say, look, if statism simply means the existence of a state with certain monopolistic powers, well, then I'm a statist in that regard. And I and my contention is that the Catholic Church is robustly statistic in that regard, <laughs> like not even not even a little bit, not even close to uh, saying, oh, no, they're not. Oh, no. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. And we're going to we're going to talk about that. So it's going to be a really good time. And uh, so if you haven't seen that, make sure to go check it out. I don't know if the podcasts are out yet for uh, meaning of Catholic. I know that Tim wants to begin making the shows into podcasts. And I, I'd like to hear how this one rolls because I'm, I'm accustomed to that. You know, people have said they feel like it's a little bit like talk radio. That's because I did talk radio most of my life. 
And so I, I've actually struggled to kind of integrate um, different visual schemes here to say this is, you know, a visual show, not just something that you listen to and have in the background as you're doing what you do in your day, driving around or working, doing homework, lifting weights, whatever you're doing, uh, making food, right? Uh, feeding babies, <laughs> all that stuff, you know, outside working, mowing the yard, all that, you know, listen with some friends around the radio and everything. So it's been a little bit different, but, um, but yeah, so I, but those podcasts should be available. The podcasts are available, of course, of all of the shows there at, uh, Reason and Theology. So, all right. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah. Statism is natural and is previous to the church. Yeah. I, I think that it is completely natural. I think it is completely natural. And I have a picture, by the way, of myself rocking an M60, but not shirtless. You don't need that. <laughs> what are you talking about, enslaved by truth? What are you talking about, shirtless? I don't know, man. It's sounding a little bit weird. <laughs> you, want, you want to see me without a shirt on? Uh, okay. You know, but no, I have a picture of myself with an M60. I'm on top of a Humvee, man. I was protecting the base on the front lines late at night. It was totally awesome, man. Absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it. So, all right, let's see. Um, yeah, someone said, uh, Andrea says, the best government is the government that rules the least. That is the American version of Catholic subsidiarity. Kind of, sort of, maybe. I, I have a different view, you know, and I, look, I'm, I'm a stick in the mud. I wrote um, over at the Distributist Review, I wrote an article. It was wildly popular at the time uh, called, Will the Real Subsidiarity Please Stand Up? And, and for people who want to know, it was funny. I was actually, it was a conversation with, with Kennedy and in the green room, and he was talking about how, you know, the, the debate that took place between Thomas Stork and uh, uh, Thomas Woods Jr., and how they, they had this big disagreement. It was online. They're going back and forth and stuff like that. Um, and, and I said, yeah, I said, actually, there's, a, there's a, a blog online that you can go back and find that documented the development of that entire thing, put a, put a timeline with it, chronicled it uh, for everybody. And in there, they talk about certain articles that played a role in that entire thing. And your boy has two articles listed there. <laughs> so, so yeah, so my articles played a role in this, right? In the way that it was all, the scuffle was going nuts and stuff. So there's a couple articles in there, but one of those is, will the real subsidiarity please stand up? And I make a contention that rather than uh, thinking of it as levels up and down, that it's spherical and that there are certain um, roles within various spheres, but that these spheres at times are porous. And so you have an overlap, an intersection, right? Like a Venn diagram. And that the church, in fact, advocates this. It not, it not just permits it. Because otherwise, you know, like people will say, uh, if it can be uh, uh, efficiently done at a lower level, then that's all that matters. Well, the question is, well, what do they mean by efficiently? And what do they say elsewhere about the responsibility of the state? Not just, not just the right of the state to do this or that, but the responsibility of the state to do this or that. And then say, well, that's also something that the church has said that the private sector can do and intermediate groups can do. Well, that's an intersection. You, you, know, you know, have overlapping spheres is what you've got. And so, so I take a, a little bit of different position. Um, let's see here. Yeah, and Andre, you, you said, wait, wait, wait a second. You said, I'm, I'm set of a contest. What are you talking about? <laughs> you said you weren't. Have you, have you all of a sudden embraced that? Is it true? Is it true, Andrea? No, I don't know about that. The atheistic state that rules in Italy. Yeah. So, all right, we're going to move on. Okay. We, as, as I said, we're, we're going to go ahead and talk and we get this window capture out of here. All right. So, we've been talking so far. Actually, let me go ahead and get this off. We've been talking about Christian apologetics, right? And, and I, I make a contention, kind of like I do with the paleocrat wager. And somebody wasn't, you know, it, it was Kennedy again. He wasn't sure. He's like, paleocrat wager? What is that? I'm like... You're, you are a contributing editor, man, at 1 Peter 5. <laughs> I wrote an article, and it talks about the paleocrat wager and what that is. Okay, this idea, and I won't go into great detail, but the idea that, you know, you have a difference of opinion between people who say that they're not convinced that we're living in the end times and others that believe that we are and that it's an eminent thing, that Christ could come back at any second now. And they're, and they're kind of preppers in a way, like spiritual preppers in a way. And that's okay, However, I said, I believe that this impacts social theory and social action. I said, I also think it smacks, it kind of makes almost a mockery a little bit of um, Pope St. Pius X's encyclical on restoring all things in Christ the King. And I said, so my wager is this, is that I don't anticipate that we're living through it right now, and I don't anticipate 
that we are going to experience it imminently. But if I'm if I'm incorrect about that, at least I'm ready. I said at least I'm fully prepared. I am I'm focusing on uh, the internal ideas of of who we are. What's our you know, the the anatomy of the soul, the anatomy of of faith, the anatomy of apostasy, how to avoid it. Right, talking about the roads of of salvation and of perfection, and following in the footsteps of the saints, and resolving every day, in fact, to take a knee for Jesus Christ every single day. So it, being somebody whose lamp is always burning, if he comes, he comes, it's burning, but I need to keep marching forward. And that way, if he does not, if he tarries longer, which so far, every every group that's ever said it's about to happen, every one of them have been wrong. The only consolation is that we're maybe uh, closer to it happening now than we were then, but that's, you know, a truism. And I said, the, the alternative is that a lot of the people that focus on that, the alternative in the wager is that the alternative is that people are, uh, they're so focused on the end and that we're living in the end that there's an escapist mentality that typically takes place. And you can see this even sociologically with let's all run for the hills. Let's all run out into the wilderness. And we see that, okay? We see that it's no longer, it's no longer leaven in the batch. It's we need to bunker in. We need to hold, in, you know, hold up because it's all coming to a close. And I said, insofar as any of those individuals, some of those might say, well, yeah, but I also want people to go out and vote. I want to be on a school board, so on, so on. I said, well, that's kind of like, you know, uh, uh, shining the brass on the Titanic. You know, Titanic's going down, and you're like, what are you doing? And you're like, I'm shining the brass. I'm making sure everything looks spotless. I'm washing, go wash the dishes right now. <laughs> we're going down, we're all dying, but go wash the dishes. That, that is a serious issue. I mean, there's a cognitive dissonance there that's through the roof. And, and it's going to fault more often than not on a kind of despair and pessimism regarding any kind of action whatsoever. And I said, so my wager is I'm going to fall on the side of optimism and yet be ready at all times in case the bridegroom comes. And it's the same thing with Christian apologetics, challenging a paradigm and saying so much of what we've done for so long is premised on this idea of premise and conclusion that we just simply say, well, look, I'm going to debate this point with you. I'm going to provide you a syllogism and you're going to do this, you know, rational thing where you're going to process and go, well, thank you for that factual information. I will process that when I'm alone at home and talk about the unmoved mover to myself and, and drive around and say, man, there is an unmoved mover. And that that's the end of the debate. And maybe they'll come to the church. And I said, we're seeing that that's becoming increasingly ineffective, increasingly so. Right? Where, where in some ways it feels at times when you watch debates, it almost feels like a game a little bit. It does. It feels like a game, no matter how serious the people are who are involved in that. And that really it solidifies the sides. And that's part of apologetics. There's no problem with that because, you know, well, not solidifying the side of, of uh, wickedness, but solidifying the faith within somebody. That's part of that. In fact, it's the bottom here op uh, opposing beliefs. It's function is both to fortify the believer against personal doubts and to remove the intellectual stumbling blocks that inhabit the conversion of unbelievers. My, my emphasis isn't so much the intellectual stumbling blocks, because I think that the intellect follows, in many cases, the will for an unbeliever, that they have a desire and that their, their intellect is like a press secretary that's, that's excusing and making justifications. Have you seen, by the way, when, when you turn on the news, sometimes if you still do that sort of thing, and you're, you're watching the news and you tune in and you're hearing a press secretary talk about whatever the president is doing. That person is a hardly believable individual, let me tell you. you, you there's very, very, very rarely is there just cause to believe them because their whole purpose up there is to defend. You're, you're never going to hear a very nuanced remark from a press secretary that goes, well, you know, I think the president was wrong about that. Nope, that's not their job. That's not their role within that system. Their role in that system is to give a val they're an apologist. They are they are a, they are giving an apologetic a defense. And they're not going to admit they're wrong, especially not in modern times. I mean that's it it's unthinkable, unimaginable, maybe even unbecoming of that per particular position in fairness to them, right? But that's one of those things. And you say I think that's how a lot of people are too that when we approach them in the mind and we're just going after their mind and their mind and their mind, we're not, we're not even taking into effect the idea that they are in their mind that they are suppressing the truth for a lie. That they're suppressing the truth. That they're looking at an order that, can that, that the, these attributes, right, of God, they can be clearly seen. And yet what? They fall prey to idolatry. 
Why? Because, because of their will, because of original sin, because of the ordering of those things. That's why we have to renew our mind. If they're not renewing their mind and you're just giving them information, think about it this way too. When you're in debates with people, right? And you're online and it's inevitable. I mean, if you're online, you've, you've debated people. That's just the way it goes. So if you're online and, and someone has brought something up that really irks you, right? It's really gotten under your craw. And, 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 or it makes you doubt and makes you a little bit confused and you don't know the answer to it. What do you do? Do you look up things that, do you just look it up in general and say, well, this is the topic, you know, let's say problem of evil and you throw it up there and do you just read anything or do you go to trusted sources to find those arguments that defend your particular position? Now you might say, well, of course I do that. It's what, you know, I'm not just going to go and, and look up any, any, you know, anybody on the planet to see what they have to say about it. I'm trying to fortify my position. And you go, yes, and so is the unbeliever. So is the unbeliever. They're not there looking in a neutral way. Their, their first reaction is not neutral. Why? Is it because they went from neutrality of just saying, I'm, I'm suspending my biases and I just want to hear the true information. Whatever's true, I'm just going to accept and believe. Or is that just something they like to tell themselves? Because they do the exact same thing. And if they see something that is unsettling to them, and studies have been done on this, that show over and over and over that if somebody goes and looks up something and it's unsettling to them, all of a sudden the mind just starts firing, boom, 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 and they've got to escape that. They have to find relief from that. So what do they do? They either back away from it or they go and search to find things that agree with them. It's one of the things about really smart people, in fact. Really smart people, by and large, it's not that they have a wide breadth. It's not like a bunch of Renaissance men. It's, it's rather that individuals uh, happen to be able to know a lot about positions that they believe. And so they fortify their positions. So you're dealing with different fortresses. And what I've said about this is that, that we've, we've got things in our stack out of order. And that order that we've got it out of order with is that we, we take 1 Peter 3, 15, right? If anyone asks you to give an account of the hope which you cherish, be ready at all times to answer for it. And we take that to mean that we have to know a bunch of these, um, these arguments, these syllogisms, these, ex these very difficult philosophical concepts. And what I say is that that right there, that, that verse, both before it and after it, it's couched completely within a context that doesn't look at that. Instead, it looks at things like having the same thoughts, sharing the same feelings, lovers of the brethren, being tender-hearted, modest, and humble not repaying injury with injury or hard words with hard words, blessing the people that curse you. This is what God demands of you and you will inherit a blessing in return. Keep your tongue clear of harm, your lips free from every treacherous word. Neglect the call for evil. Let peace be all thy quest and aim. Do good. Yeah. If only what is good is inspiring your ambitions, right? Who can do you wrong? So it's not like, well, just get all, the, get all the right arguments. I mean, every single one of those things is a very practical thing. And it's all about holy living because it's, it's part of the same corpus that talks about living epistles and that that's in fact what we are, that we're the body of Christ, we're living epistles. And just, just who we are and how we respond to situations. Now, that's not to say that any of these arguments are bad. In fact, they're very important because... They help to fortify the believer against personal doubts. And in certain occasions, when the person is at that place where they're, rather than being combative, where they're at the place where they say, well, you know, I, I am, am really doubting my doubt at this point. And the doubt of the doubt begins to take over. It's reached a critical mass. I experienced that when I was an atheist, that I, I got to a point where you always doubt your doubt a little. There's always that doubt, you, uh, doubting your doubt. Uh, James K. Smith says that that's the, the unbeliever's faith. But if you get to that point, then all of a sudden it makes a little more sense. But you have to enthrone Christ as Lord in your hearts. Suffer in the cause of right. Do not be afraid or disturbed by threats. Be courteous with due reverence. What matters is you need to have a clear conscience. So defamers of your holy life... Okay, and that's right after that. That's in verse 16. So what I, my emphasis, and again, I need, to, I need to emphasize that it's simply an emphasis. It's a placement in the stack, a placement in the order. 
And that's why we've been going through this. If you haven't seen the episodes before this, I really encourage you to do so. I really encourage you to do so. You know, someone says the intellect follows the will. Very true. St. Thomas of Aquinas. Yes, St. Thomas of Aquinas. Even even unbelievers and even wacko, you know, folks like Thomas Jefferson, you know, he didn't believe in, in miracles. He, he demystified the New Testament, which is blasphemous, right? But he demystified it, right? The life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth type thing. And so, you know, but even, even both of them, David Hume, you know, people who, who are not at all known for faith, <laughs> these folks, they, they recognize that as well. And so that's, look, we, it's, it's a verifiable thing at this point. So this rational chooser model, right? This, you're, you're making rational decisions all the time that we're just, we're, we're like little Spocks picking the, the, best, the best decision all the time. That's just fake. That's just fake. And I think we all know that. We can walk around, especially in America, and walk around. And, you know, you got, you got hyper-obese people left and right, right? Mount, mounding down a bunch of, you know, Almond Joys and stuff. Mounding down a bunch of Mickey D's. Not doing too good for themselves, and you say, "Man, well, that person. Like, do you know that that's the case? And do you know? Do you know maybe that's not healthy for you?" And like, back off! <laughs> I'm hungry <laughs> because they're just following animalistic impulses. And to one degree or another, that's true of everyone. That's why we have to fight against that. That's why we have to make that resolution to to confess our sins, to do penance, and to amend our lives. So Father Lasan says. Resurrection and recognition, okay? When a socialistic pamphlet is intended for distribution among the working classes, the author frequently depicts their misery in harrowing terms. It is true that the lot of the laboring man is a hard one. And the modern uh, impious socialist tells him this over and over again. But hear what sort of comfort he offers. This is, this is, this is basically a quote here. Because, well, he, he quotes him. He says, because your church points you, if, if, if we look at this, we say, look at the world links. And he, he brings up socialists, right, writing in a newspaper. But think about anybody in the world that's talking about the difficulty that people go through in their lives. We all go through these things. I, I mean, that's central to the whole thing of, of 1 Peter 3 that we quoted. Okay? So that's, that's central to it. The idea that, that we're all enduring very, very difficult things. And we have to live upright. We have to have a clear conscience. We need to be able to provide a reason for the hope that we have. To say the hope of, of, of in fact, exactly what we're talking about right now. Because your church points you as a Catholic to a better life than this. To a life where you will find rest after your toil. If you, while on earth, have served God with a clean heart and have applied yourself to your daily tasks with a pure intention. That's, that's literally pulling right out of First uh, Peter 3. It is. He says, who is right? You with your blissful hope or this newspaper writer with his cold and miserable comfort, despair? And here's the, here, here's the quote with him. Uh, he, he talks about, oh, I thought I, I thought I had that in there. You're talking about uh, you know, that, that your faith isn't going to lead you to true happiness, that, that the faith isn't really supporting the poor. Are you going to believe that? Or are you going to believe what the church says about that? People watching this channel, people watching this show, there's about a 99% chance that they support the latter, that they have no interest, of course, in what the socialist has to say. And yet, on an intellectual level, and yet, so much of how we live, it's difficult to trust. It's difficult to believe, and, and in part, not just, not just for bad reasons, but sometimes perfectly reasonable ones that we say, man, look, look at this. Look at how bad it is. Look at how terrible things are. It's hard sometimes to see that there is an escape hatch other than that Christ comes down on a white horse or something, <laughs> that that's it, or Peter and Paul are up there, and they come down, and they're like, we're going we're gonna to plant a new, new pope on the throne sort of thing. And by the way, I got it. This is just as an aside, Andrea. I you I want you to in in. <laughs> I you know I love you, 
and I don't, we're not going to talk about set of a contest here, but you were insistent when we first started talking that you weren't a set of a contest. And, and I said, well, you know, you, you go to a church with a mass that is that way. It's another one of those things. That's the near occasion of sin. In fact, I, I, I said, uh, it was a video talking about, uh, um, to avoid the near occasion of heresy or, uh, uh, avoid the near occasion of schism. And it was one of those things. And it is a complicated subject, yes, I mean, no, no doubt about it, but it was one of those things that I, I really hope that I'm not reading, I hope I'm, I actually hope I'm reading it wrong here. I hope I'm reading it wrong, because that would be a real tragedy, I feel. It would be something that's kind of like, yeah, I mean, you know, if someone hangs around the, around the strip club all the time and makes excuses for why they're there, I wouldn't be surprised if eventually they pay for a lap dance. I think it's the same kind of thing when people go to churches that, that don't cite the Pope and stuff. And I think that, that that would it would really break my heart. But I hope you can reach out to me. I know you you you're a good person, and I care about you sincerely. Okay. And we do live in ter- in tumultuous times, so I'm not no no harsh judgments. I've been there, but I hope I'm reading it wrong. <laughs> I hope I'm reading it wrong. Do you therefore, my dear young friend, practice virtue and flee from vice? There's a there's a resurrection and a recompense. Take courage and let not your hands be weakened for there shall be a reward for your work. It's one of those things that, you know, when, when we, when we get down, sometimes isn't it, isn't it common that when we get down, it's easy to, to, um, to not do what we have to do, that it's, it's, it's deflating, it's demotivating. It, it, it reminds me of that demotivational picture with the person, you know, a runner and got his hand on his head, his hand on his head. And it says, Failure when your best just isn't good enough. <laughs> that sort of thing. Isn't doesn't it feel that way sometimes that when you when you get down and you're looking around at you and you see the conditions of the world and the difficulty of the things that we're going through, that w- when you when you see that and when you experience that and it really touches close to home, that it's easy to to be the kind of person that finds yourself sitting in a chair staring at a screen, eating a bunch of Doritos and such, drinking too much beer. Wondering whether you should light up a joint or something. Isn't that, isn't that the way it works? That so often it's demotivating. And that's where we have to switch. We have to, to flip the script. We have to flip the script and realize that that's actually all the more reason for us to take courage. How would it make any sense to take courage if it wasn't in a setting that's difficult and hard? Well, you know, it's one of those things. I, I know people, you know, they lose their job. They lose their job or they get injured. And next thing you know, they're super down and out. I've done it myself. Where all of a sudden I'm waking up every day and I'm throwing on the old sweatpants. <laughs> throwing on sweatpants and slippers and I'm sitting downstairs getting fatter by the second. I can hear myself getting fatter. Lazy. A real chump. Because I'm not taking courage. I'm allowing that, that the world and the conditions around me to lead to a place of at least a certain kind of despair. And let not your hands be weakened, for there shall be a reward for your work. So look, he's saying, look, this is not a, a reason for you. When we look at the world and we say, look at how secular it's gotten. Look at how wicked it's gotten. It's so hard. I don't know what to do. I'm out. I'm done. You know how many people make that excuse? I'm done. I believed the Bible. I read the Bible. I know it. Don't don't talk to me. I've been catechized. Take courage then. If you're not taking courage and you're letting your hands be weak, then you're not really believing that there's a reward for your work. And if you don't believe there's a reward for your work, and you say, we, maybe, you say, well, I did believe that, and I was really hardcore about it. And you're like, for what, 20 minutes? You can take that, that first world problem of yours and go fly a kite. It's so crazy when people complain about the things that they go through. And like I said on the last show, I said, when you go through something and you're really mad, shake your fist at the sky. Shake your fist at heaven. Scream, why, God? Why, God, why do you allow all this stuff to happen to me? And get mad, pound the ground, punch it as hard as you can, growl, scream, cry, grind your teeth, and all of that, and then look 
at the crucifix. Behold the man and be ashamed. <laughs> you have gone through nothing, nothing. And slave says, become, hang in there, cat. Andrew says in the comments, take courage. It's all been foretold. Yes, and it's all foreseen. It's all according to a plan. If, if people, when, when, they, when they get down like that, that is an evidence not of anything wrong with God. It's an evidence that something is wrong with them. They're not courageous. They're not valiant. In fact, that's the sign of a quitter. That's the sign of a boo-hoo person. Boo hoo for me, person. And in fact, a narcissist. Because most of the people that say, man, you know what, I, I, I did this and this has been going really bad for me. I, I have, a, I have a, a picture in my room. My sister one year, she bought me a, as, a, as a present. My sister does this kind of thing. <laughs> she, she buys presents that are a little bit different. She bought me a present one year by paying money to give a water buffalo right, that would help with work for a tribe that's, that's just, you know, overseas in a far off land. And it was a, it was a picture of the water buffalo, in fact. Right? And, you have, and I believe it's a Catholic priest standing there in the, in the water, right? And there's kids playing around this water buffalo and such. And that water buffalo is going to help those people. You look at those people, man, and, and you say, man, these people are, are splashing around in the water and having fun and they're working, and they're, they're getting a water buffalo to help them take courage and keep on working. That priest sitting there with his beads, right? And you sit there and you go, so when people, when people in, in first world countries especially, they get so down, I don't know, you know, God, you've really let me down. And they go to their refrigerator that's packed with food. They don't, they're, not, they're not asking for help to get a water buffalo to help them. And even if they were, guess what? Most of those people would be able to go start a GoFundMe to start a Fiverr or something, to call friends on a phone, to have them wire money to them. I mean, they're in a world of, of great supply. And that's not to say that people aren't in a spot where they don't have any money. I've been there too. I've had, but even then, I went to, I went to churches. I've, I've had the, the humbling experience of having no money where we had to go as a family. We went to a local church and we got bread. And canned items and stuff. But we kept smiling. We took courage. And at the time, we were convinced that there was a reward for our work. And the only way that you're going to get beyond that, the only way, if, you, if, if these people walk away, if they embrace that at any time, and most of the people you're going to talk to are unbelievers, most of those people are probably people who were raised, they were, they were at least churched in their life at some point, and they've walked away. And so you're not just talking to somebody who's most of the time, most of the time, and, and this is actually becoming a real problem. You're seeing more and more of this where people are just completely unchurched. They've never gone. They've never seen it. They've never anything. That does happen, strangely enough, even in a world where there's churches on every corner. But a lot of times, it's be, as I said, it's because of sin. It's because, it's because of sin that all of a sudden, because their will, that they rationalize not taking courage anymore that they rationalize weakening their hands. And, and it gets so bad that they consider weakening their hands a kind of strength, that they're really being realistic. They're not into that fairy, that fairy tale nonsense anymore. That's sin justifying the weakness of their hands. The cowardliness. The refusal to work. Which would be unsurprising that with the refusal to work and not being courageous that we're seeing the kind of uh, hard left reactions that we're seeing regarding uh, socialism, regarding opposition to e even having certain builds and frames that are that are strong in their composition, opposition even to anything to do at all with the military. It's unsurprising. They're not valiant people. They're valiantly reaching for their controller to watch more Netflix. Oh, good for you. And, and we shouldn't play footsies with that. We should tell them, say, look, I'm not impressed by that at all. I'm really sorry to tell you. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm really saddened by that. And, and I'm saddened because you don't even have the sense of shame that it's due. And 
There are people both young and old who have no appetite for anything better than the miserable hay and oats of earthly delights. People to whom pleasure and gold seem to constitute a heaven upon earth. They long for animal enjoyments, not for celestial joys. Such persons would be willing to learn how to pray. And I, this is actually one of those things, man, that you won't hear very often that, that really, I think, causes Father Lassance to really stand out. Just a real diamond in the rough, right? He says this, he says that, that such persons, these individuals, that all they want is the animal pleasures and enjoyment, right? They're the Tinder generation. They're the next flicks gender, uh, 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 generation that are that are I was gonna say generation. <laughs> they are they're part of the next the Netflix generation. <laughs> it's true. They're part of the generation, guys. Those animal enjoyments, ranging from fluid to furry. But they're not pursuing celestial joys. They've embraced the the imminent frame of of reality that everything is nothing more than what they can see, touch, hear, taste, smell. Such persons would willingly learn how to pray. Indeed, they would go on praying until their voice failed. If only God would grant them just one request. Do you know what it is? Just take a second and think. Don't read ahead. <laughs> Don't read ahead. Close your eyes. Think about it and say, what, what would the unbeliever, the person who's, who's wrapped up with animal amusements, what would that person pray for? Pray, pray all the time. Pray until their, their voice went out. Pray all night long. In fact, in some ways, they almost are already. And what you think would be this request? Do you imagine that these votaries of pleasure would pray for spiritual and eternal gifts? They cannot bear the thought of death and eternity. It's one of the things that's it's hilarious to me. I, I used to be a little bit bewitched by this. The, the idea you hear with so many atheists that religion is simply a cult that, that has wrapped itself and, and swaddled the fear of death. That that's all it is. Fear of death is a human thing, no doubt. But the idea that, that religion is simply nothing more than the swaddling clothes of the fear of death, don't think so. Not even close. And the unbeliever, when they say that, it's almost as if they say, well, I'm not afraid of death. And we've seen that exposed, haven't we? We've seen that exposed with the cult of the, you know, <coughs> thing and the cult of the, we, we all need to talk like this to each other. I don't want you to see my smile anymore. I don't want you to see if I'm grimacing. Those folks. You better put on the thing thing. You better get that, you know, you better get that. I can't hear you through the. <laughs> but it's revealed something. The terror and the dread. The, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. The percentage. Did you see the percentage? That person. We need to we need to make those people leave. They're pulling a Chomsky. You know what? Maybe, maybe uh, we should just, you know, exclude all of those people and put them on like a reservation or something. They're absolutely freaked out to die. That's why they're scrambling around, hoping and praying to their futurist, uh, sci scientific gods and the priesthood there in the lab coats that one day, one day there will be a robot or a computer that I can download my brain into and I can live forever. They just got to just oil my parts. Because they don't want to die. Because they're afraid of annihilation. More than that, they're afraid because they, deep down inside, suspect that it will not be annihilation. And in fact, they suspect that they will live a very long time in a place that can't properly be called life. They cannot bear the thought of death in eternity. I've already told you that their heaven is on earth. Their sole wish is that the Almighty would make a bargain with them and promise that they should never grow old, that they should never die. You do not hear them say, I desire to be dissolved with St. Paul. Oh, no. But I desire to remain here, to live forever on earth. That's what they say. 
And, they, and at this point, they might add to that, well, not just Earth, this is just a tiny blue dot in a cosmos. Instead, the probability is that there's a lot of planets in the Goldilocks zone that one day we'll be able to go pl visit and play on Mars and such. Yeah. Listen to this bit of wisdom from that smart journalist, that socialist, right? Of whom I was referring to in the preceding chapter. He writes, quote, The earth was assigned to us as our abode in order that we might enjoy it to our heart's content, seek for pleasure, and find our satisfaction in it. That's just seething with secularism. That's, that's, that's an atheist screed. Those who in exchange for our tears and lamentations offer us nothing but the sight of a dim and distant heaven only point to a future life are either not the true friends of the poor man and of the human race in general or they're victims of a morbid self-delusion. <laughs> yeah. Oh, if you, if you talk about that, well, I mean, look, if, they, if we offer them nothing but that, okay, look, I kind of get it a little bit. That's the biggest straw man in the universe. That is a straw man. By this point in history, you know how much had been written on Catholic social teaching? Do you, know, do, you, do you know how much had been written about the preference of the poor? How, how workers can have share in, in the means of production? Do you know? In defense of guilds? Even at this point, in defense of unions at this point? The popes? Do they even know? What a buffoon. He, he, he loses all that. Why? Because he saw, maybe, he said, maybe you could say, well, I know I'm familiar with that. I've seen it. I've seen it. But I've also seen where they condemn socialism. You can't be a Christian socialist. I've seen it. I've read it. I'm like, yeah, because socialism is for scumbags. <laughs> like, yeah, it's totally true. Because, because it defies the natural order of things as well as the divinely instituted order of things. It defies it. Because it leads to this sort of thing right here. And Lassant's a self-delusion. Pray, where did this scribbler discover this? <laughs> don't, you don't you love it? Can you almost hear him saying it? Pray, where did this scribbler discover this? What? He's sitting there scribbling down his thoughts. Barfing all over the planet with his thoughts. <laughs> Read my stuff. It's like that... that barfing scene from Team America with the the, Mary, the puppets. <laughs> the barfing scene where he just doesn't stop. And just going everywhere. All over the place. And you're like, that's what this writer is like. Lassance is like, man, what's up with this guy? But the real thing, though, is this. Where in the world does he get this from? Because if you think about it, how many things do people say with an air of authority that has universal application? And you say, where do you get that? By what authority? You know, you come to me and I make a joke. I say these folks are the people like this. We do this, right? We come down the mountain, everybody. I'm coming down the mountain with my Ten Commandments made of paper ache and written in crayon. And you're like, dude, I'm not impressed. Derp. Just cuckoo crazy pants. Where do they get the authority for that? And again, that's, that's the swaddling clothes of their own personal prejudice, their well-wishing. In a world that's devoid of God, where do they even get this idea? And look, look how it comes out. Look how it comes out. The earth was assigned to us as our abode in order. Assigned, assigned is, is this idea of agency. Where do they get that from? Where would this where would this cat even get that from? Again, falling on their own sword. Falling on their own sword, relying on on truths that only make sense within our world view, relying on those truths to make uh to smack us in the face. It's like I said before, the the metaphor of the idea that that God puts people um people can only slap God in the face if he first puts them on his lap. And that's what they do. 
How often have we done that? Ungrateful children. Cowardly children. And yet God still loves us. Isn't that humiliating for us? Isn't that shameful for us? But it's also merciful and it's hopeful. St. Peter admonished us, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims on earth to refrain yourselves from carnal desires which war against the soul. Let us quit the polluted realms of the terrestrial heaven and raise our eyes to the true heaven. And why are we to do this? This is Lassance again. Because the world and its pleasures pass away. The happiness which it offers us in its honors and riches and pleasures will never satisfy our hearts, which are made for the enjoyment of higher and better things. And he talks about Solomon. And he says he didn't leave anything untried. What was the result of that? Was he satisfied? No. Vanity of vanities. Vanity and vanity all around. Ups, downs, all arounds, doesn't matter. Vanity of vanities. All things are vanity. And somebody could say, well, it's kind of weird. Didn't he say we should just quit the world? Didn't he just say that? Does that mean we should all, you know, go out to the desert? Does that mean we should be escapists where we're kind of in our own little la-la land? And you say, no, because he's also talking about apologetics. He's also talking about evangelization. He's also talking about the Catholic social teaching. It's a matter of emphasis. It's a matter of priority and presupposition. We need to we need to weed that out of our hearts and our minds. And how do we do it? By subjecting all of those things to Christ. By casting down every thought and imagination and so easy it's so easy sometimes when we hear phrases like that, right? To cast them down, every thought and imagination that dares, in fact, to exalt itself against Christ the King and the truth of Christ the King. That when we hear sentiments like those, robustly biblical sentiments, when we hear that, our, our initial thought is that it applies to somebody else. It starts with us. House cleaning starts in the house of God. Discipline starts in the house of God. We should be, we should be coming at ourselves and, and trying to, to know ourselves in a way that, that St. Teresa of Avila talks about, that, how important that is in the interior castle, how important that is within her method of, of mental prayer, her method of contemplation, her method of prayer in general, to say, to know thyself. And to see that, yes, I need to cast these things down. And even through my example, because if I cast those thoughts and imaginations down, I subject them to Christ the King, I, I, I um, turn myself over completely to his providence and say, God, I give it to you. I will be courageous in this because I have to believe that all things will work to the better, that all things will work to the good, because I'm striving to love you as imperfectly as I do. I'm striving. I truly feel sorry. I'm heartily sorry for what I have done. I heartily resolve. I firmly resolve to do penance when I make those mistakes, to confess them, to do penance for them, and to amend my life. Away, therefore, with this beggarly rubbish. <laughs> Oh, I love you, Father Lassant. <laughs> I love you. I want to start talking more like that. This beggarly rubbish. And he was American. I mean, it's like you, you read this and you're thinking like, oh, you know, it's like a British thing. Like he would sound British. Well, he lived in America, right? So he lived in America. His family came over. We talked about that in the first episode. Give the bio about him. If you want to learn more about him, that's in the very first episode. With the heaven which this world promises you, you were born to something better. Your inheritance is not here. But I love how he qualifies this. Should your lot be a prosperous one in this world? Okay, like what is he saying? Don't, don't desire anything. Maybe a little. But even if you didn't desire it, well, you know, are you still going to benefit from things? God, look, God uh, reigns on the just and the unjust. The, sign, the, the, the sun shines on the just and the unjust. 
Should your lot be a prosperous one in this world? You ought to long far more for that blessed place where your joy will be complete and everlasting. So he's not saying, you know, that, that if you have anything of wealth at all, if you have anything of financial prosperity, that you need to just simply say, well, I don't want any of that. That might, in fact, be your lot. That may be your lot in this world. And if people think that that's not true, I would say, well, it seems like a lot for a lot of people in the world that they're born in places where they're not even remotely close to that and the means are not even at their disposal. And that's the second half. Should afflictions be your portion? Bear them with resignation. If only you can attain eternal happiness. Bear them with resignation, that's courage. You are valiant when you do that. You are a warrior when you do that. It's like being Rocky and getting punched left and right and knowing that you're wearing the other team down and that there will come a time where that's going to start happening. And you're just going to start rocking it out. Why? Because the Lord is working through you. He's got it under control. Instead of screaming Adrian, you're screaming Abe. You've got your rosary in your hand. That's why. Let earth give you what it will. Right? Let earth give you what it will. You have a vocation in life. You have stuff you got to do. You got to take care of business. Right here, let earth take care, or, uh, right here, it says, uh, let earth give you what you will. It cannot give you heaven. In other words, no eminent frame here. Let earth take from you what it will. It can never deprive you of heaven. So either which way you go, either which way you go, you are winning. Why? Because you're on the winning team. Why? Because, you know, God's on that team. And God ain't going to lose. God ain't going to lose. Therefore, farewell, O vain and fleeting world. Draw near, O blissful heavenly dwelling place. Draw near. O paradise, O paradise, who doth not crave for rest, who would not seek the happy land where they that love are blessed, where loyal hearts and true stand ever in the light, all rapture through and through in God's most holy sight. Oh, paradise, oh, paradise, tis weary waiting here. I long to be where Jesus is, to feel, to see him near. Oh, Jesus, thou the beauty art of angel worlds above. Thy name is music to the heart, enchanting it with love. Oh, my sweet Jesus, hear the sighs which unto thee I send. To thee my inmost spirit cries, my being, hope, and end. Jesus, I got to scroll up. Jesus, our only joy be thou, as thou our prize wilt be. Jesus, be thou our glory now and through eternity. By the way, in the comments, by the way, take care, Andrea. And you know how to get a hold of me, bud. We'll pray for each other, okay? Is that the deal? God bless you, buddy. With courage like that of a lion, the young man rushes forth into the hostile world. This is to trust in God, right? But to say, I, you know, I, I love the, uh, let me see here. Um, I love the, um, the poetry in this book. I wish that the slide was working. I had it on lock, so I wasn't able to, <laughs> I wasn't able to slide. And I'm like, oh, no. I was getting confused multitasking in a, in a poetic rendition. I might make a video on that because I love it. A, po- a poetic reading. And I'll do more of those. I've had people complain <laughs> that I haven't been doing them. Because I, I have some really good ones, right? To hope, right? What love is. I, have, there's a, I think I've got three or four that I've done readings. But he talks about when you trust in God. Okay, so we've said, all right, you got you to trust in God, right? You got to deal with with faith. You got to deal with hope. You got to deal with love. But but how does that come out? How how should that help us 
in being courageous in overcoming those things that are difficult in our life, that we may best serve not only the Lord, but our, our own life and those we love, our families, our churches, our neighbors, but ultimately, too, to be an evangelical witness, to be, be a living epistle to the world, beaming with light of truth, the Lord. Trust in God, be of good cheer. With courage like that of a lion, the young man rushes forth into a hostile world. Same thing with a woman. This is from the men's guide. Same thing with a woman. They're both rushing into a hostile world. They're both being raised. I, I look at my kids. I got, a, I got a daughter and I got a son. And they, each of them are going to have uh, um, struggles, right? Some struggles more for men. Some struggles more for women. But there's, a, there's an overlap for this because we're human. There's a shared experience. It appears as if nothing could prevent these young people from attaining their highest aims, from realizing their youthful ideals. But alas, no sooner do the first obstacles present themselves, no sooner do they perceive that they will have to struggle and fight. No sooner do a few words of mockery or contradiction sound in their ears than their lion-like courage vanishes. They no longer feel the joy of battle. Nerveless, inert, they drop their wings. How true. You know, young people, <laughs> young people, and, and that's why I said it's good for everybody. It's good. It, it doesn't matter if you're young or old to read these because we can say when we're older, we can go, I know, I get it. I get it, and, I, and this, is, this will help me to better explain this to younger people. This will maybe help me to better understand myself now that I'm older. But how often is that true that they have these high aims, these, these ro highly romanticized ideas for what the world is like and how they're going to change the world? You want to hear about it? You want to know how bad it is? Take the smartest of them, the most intellectual of them, the savvy ones in high school, the valedictorians, and go and listen to their speeches at graduation. Some of that stuff is cuckoo nonsense. You can do anything in the world. There's nothing you can't do. You just, you know, <laughs> if anybody come to it, you can do. Not always true. Tell that to tell that to the quadriplegic. We can say, look, you know, Michael Jordan can dunk from the free throw line. You can do it too, buddy. Wrong. Wrong. You know, tell the guy, the guy who's sadly born with no arms and legs, that he'll be a great valet driver. You know, it'd be, it'd be a race car driver. Like, look, I mean, maybe, maybe there'll be technologies and stuff. But as it stands right now, that person's like, you know, give me a break, buddy. It reminds me of that SpongeBob episode where he's, he's flying around. He, he, he figured out how to put a, a blow dryer in, in the pants, and the pants blew up, and he was able to float around in the sky. And people are like, get down from there. People aren't supposed to fly. What do you think you're doing, buddy? And everybody's, oh, oh, oh. everybody's all mad at him. And somebody finally pops and he falls down. He's like, well, you know, I was dreaming. And there's a lady. And she's got you know, like two babies sitting there. And she's all kind of a little ratty. And her husband's looking all, you know, kind of frumpy and such. Wearing, you know, kind of like a, a, a wife beater or whatever. The undershirt. Wearing that. It's got stains on it. And her, she's got curlers in her hair. And she's like, you think you're the only one with unfulfilled dreams? <laughs> kind of thing. That's what I feel like every time I hear the smart kid at the, at, at the uh, graduation ceremony do a valedictorian speech. And say, this person is literally setting everybody up for failure. You can go and you can do it. And there's no reference to God. No reference to God at these ones. Public school, they're like, no, no. Not even at the baccalaureate sometimes. No, no, no. You can't mention God. That's too divisive. Why don't you just tell them they can do anything they want? And say, as the teachers, do you even believe that? We are, we are bound by... An extraordinary number of limitations, natural and otherwise. So they prop themselves up, bless their hearts. I'm glad, I'm glad the Lord right, designed it in such a way that they have that kind of ambition. From the gate, they're ripping and they're roaring. They're ripping and they're roaring, and that's good. Let's harness that. 
But don't let it go off the, the rails. And the way that we do that is to remind them and say, look, you have to direct that in such a way that you are, number one, that you've discerned this. That that way you can, you can direct that energy to direct that, that motivation that you have, the dream that you have to something that you are truly believing that God is calling you to do that he's equipped you with your gifts and talents in order to accomplish these things and then drive as hard as you can. But realize, realize that you're probably going to get in accidents. You're probably going to trip and fall. And that when you do, be of good cheer. Stand up. Brush it off. Be courageous, strong, and valiant in your weakness. In your weakness and desperate need for God's grace, for the help of the sacraments, stand up, young man. Stand up, young women, and march forward because you just started the race. And you will deal with people mocking you. You know, people are like, you know, you have, you have people who dislike your videos. You, you have people who say mean things. And, I, and, you know, I used to actually take that really seriously. Like, if people would say mean things in the comments, I always felt like, this need to defend myself. And it, and it was projecting this idea, presenting to the world this idea that in fact I was strong, but that's weak. And, and I told somebody not long ago, they brought up and said, I hope that these comments in the comments sometimes that are really mean to you, that you um, don't allow these things to get you down. And I said, I expect them. If I'm doing the best I can, and if I am fighting tooth and nail, talking about sin, talking about the need for confession and penance, talking about the root of the evils of this world, talking about the animal impulses that the world caves to on a daily basis. If I talk about those things, I am bound to endure mockery. I am bound to hear people contradicting what I like to think. Defending themselves defending themselves, putting up barriers to say, I don't want to think about that, man. They don't even like, you know how many people don't like the fact that I'm saying that the reason why they left the church, the reason why they walk away, the reason why they reject the Pope, the reason why they do all these things, apostasy, schism, sin. You know how many people like that? People who aren't doing that. <laughs> people who aren't doing those things, they, they, appreciate this. They've read it in the saints. They know it's true. But people are so afraid to speak in that way, to echo the saints, to echo those divine truths which are laid down by the magisterium. They're afraid, they're timid, because people will say, well, how dare you? You're telling me that it's not because I took an astronomy class? You're telling me that it's, because, it's not because I took a philosophy class where I, I read, you know, stuff by uh, Dawkins? Yeah, I am saying that. You're telling me that it's not because, you know, I watched Cosmos about the little blue dot in the universe going nowhere with no purpose and design. Are you telling me that? Yes, I am. Sin. I don't know which one it is, but you do. And you're holding it like a volleyball under the water and hoping nobody notices. Confess it. And I'm not saying that in a, in, a, in a pompous way. I'm not coming to them as a Pharisee. I'm saying, you know what? I'll see you in the confession line, bro. I'll hold the door like someone held the door for me. But I have to see you there. Because if not, I'm not going to see you there in heaven. And I want to. So I'm not going to play footsies. I'm not going to play footsies and try to say, well, okay, uh, it was because you watched Cosmos. It's because of Neil deGrasse Tyson. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because of SpaceX. <laughs> no. I'm going to tell you what the saints have said. I'm going to tell you what the scripture says. It's a constant tradition. Echoing one another. It's because of sin. And if the force of temptation assails him, and weak and inexperienced as the young man or woman are, they fall into sin and fall very deeply and grievously, then, instead of rising up, 
with courage and energy, they lie in an abyss of their first sin. They abandon themselves to cowardice or even to despair. Never to never do this, my friend. However hopeless the case may appear, whatever the circumstances may be, take courage, be of good cheer, trust in God. That he, he is a priest of the people, isn't he? Father Lassance. He's a priest for Johnny Q and Sally Sue. He's a priest of the people. He's got his finger on the pulse here. And he says, never think or say, and, and not only have you been there, but have you heard other people? I, I, you know, I have the, I have the, the honor, in fact, to have where people reach out to me and they, they talk about things that sometimes I have to inform them that's above my pay grade. You really need to go and you need to talk to a priest about it. It's not something I can actually, you know, help you with. And I ought not. I know people who do. And that's a dangerous thing for them to do. But people who say, you know, I feel like God's not going to forgive me. I've made too many mistakes. I'm a useless cause. He won't grant me the grace that's necessary. Whatever I do, I'm going to be damned. There's no help for me. Have you heard that before? Sometimes, sometimes that is a legitimate fear. And they need to be assured that in fact that's true. It's one of the reasons why, though, though I... I'm one of those guys that I'm, I'm far more interested in hearing the stories of people who were raised Catholic and didn't walk away than people who walked away and entertained the world and came back like prodigals, right? But I also recognize the, the role of a prodigal. It, people can reach out to me and say that, and I say, bro, I've actually been there. I know what that's like, but sometimes you can assure them that that's the case, and they'll simply say, no, it's not. And at that point, that's another self-deceptive mechanism that they use, a mechanism of self-deceit to say, no, God doesn't forgive. God will not forgive that. And you say, man, he died for that. It doesn't matter. I'm too bad. I've gone on Tinder too many times. He was scourged. He had a crown of thorn pressed into his head. His beard ripped out. Nails through his hands and feet a spear through his side. And you think what you do at night, you think what you do with your lies, you think what you do with your perversion, you think that that's too much for him? No. No way. That is fake. Snap out, and if they don't snap out, that is a self-destructive pity party. That's an excuse that arises from despair, and you're not talking to the heart so much as the press secretary. The heart wants to keep sinning because the condition is confess your sins, do penance, and amend your life. But it is offensive, and, and people should never entertain it. When, when you hear someone say that, do not entertain that. Rebuke that. Say you're gently, gently. But if they persist in that, you have to know what you're dealing with. You are not dealing with a syllogism with these folks. You're dealing with sin so deeply rooted that they don't want to leave or they genuinely have come to a place of complete despair and you have to do better than an argument. You have to be the helping hand. You have to be the hand and the heart and the feet of the Savior who died on that cross to that person. To stand in the gap, to reach down, and to say, I'm willing to pull you up. And if they reject, you have to recognize that that's what they desire to do. They wish to perish. Perish in their lust. They know there's a price tag. But never think that. Never think that, that grace is not there for you. Again, remember the cross. Remember Calvary. Remember Golgotha. Remember the tomb. Remember Our Lady of Sorrows. Remember. And remember that resurrection.
Yeah, because St. Thomas tells us there's scarcely a greater sin than despair. And St. Augustine assures us that Judas sinned yet more grievously through despair than even by betraying his divine master. That's why we cannot be duped by that. And if we, if we get duped by the idea that that kind of despair that comes out like a little demon through a person and says, I'm not able to ever, nothing that he did, all of that stuff on that cross, all of the lashings, every sorrowful mystery that you pray in that rosy, rosary, every single one of those things, and the things not even included in it, the things surrounding it, the betrayal, the experiences that we read in the Gospels, that we see even in the Passion of Christ, that all of those things, none of those things amount to enough. Do not allow yourself to entertain that as a reasonable excuse from that person. Even if you have to gently say, you're out of your mind. You are in complete despair, I get that. But at this point, you do need to man up because that, what you're saying right now, is a worse sin than even when Judas betrayed his divine master. It is unreasonable. It is without excuse. And how awful are the consequences of the sin? The unhappy man who despairs loses courage, all joy. He falls from sin to sin because he thinks that nothing can be of any consequence since he's already lost. Thus, in his despair, he lives a wretched life here on earth till he exchanges his misery here below for the everlasting misery of hell. And this is where things start to get real. They've been real the whole time, but ends. These final ends. And you go, hell is real, man. People nowadays are really afraid to talk about that. They're afraid to say that hell is real. In part because they're afraid to believe in divine revelation. They, they, they're, they're like, well, I've never seen it. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know. And, and, and they don't want to say it to somebody else because they're afraid for themselves. And I say, that's okay. It's actually all right that you have a certain degree of fear. To say, look, I, I detest. I detest, you know, I, I, I dread the laws of heaven and the pains of hell. You dread that. That's not a mild word. That's not mild. You're not like, well, it would be a bummer a little. No. You dread that. It warrants that kind of fear. Not scrupulous, but recognizing that's a real end. And if you believe that, if you can say that act of faith, then you have to be able to look an unbeliever in the eyes and say, bro, I don't want you to go to hell. I'm not the judge on all this stuff, but hell is real. You have to use that word. You have to be, be okay using it. You have to be okay because it's real. And because as long as people try to tell themselves, and they have to know, they have to know because they're mad at the injustice of the world. And yet, and yet, they'll complain too and say, well, there's no God. Otherwise, why would bad people, why would good things happen to bad people? Why would bad things happen to good people? You hear this argument all the time from the unbeliever. That's not actually a problem for us because we aren't in an eminent frame. The world is bigger than this. But, but, if they do tremble at such things, when after a long winter it begins to lighten, thunder, and rain, it's a sign that spring is near. Therefore, when the storm agitates the heart of the sinner, that is, when his conscience torments him and exhorts him to repentance, that's when we got to start getting real with things about leading that person to that place where we're standing next to them in line. And we should not fall prey to hysteria. We should not fall prey to the kinds of tears that are, that, are, that are hysterical. It's difficult, nay more. It's impossible for a gentle, tender-hearted woman, this is in the Women's Guide, and I'll, and I'll, I'll say person, but it's true because it's, this is a true admonition for everybody. 
a gentle, tender-hearted person, never to indulge in tears, but do not weep for every trifle. In fact, is my, hey guys, I don't know if they're watching. <laughs> I don't know if they're watching right now. There's a, there, there's a uh, Little Lord Lundy. Little Lord Lundy. I'll do a reading of Little Lord Lundy over on, it's by Hilary Belloc in his book, Cautionary Tales, which is hilarious. <laughs> and if you, uh, you want to hear the story of Little Lord Lundy, who is crying all the time, and then when it's, it's, it's kind of like the crying wolf thing, but with crying. And it's a, great, it's a great story. I'll read that over at the Wolfpack chat. I'll do that after the show. Do not weep for every trifle, every contradiction, every unfriendly look, every hasty speech. Spare your tears, for hours will come when it will appear only natural and right that you should weep. Seasons when you'll have to stand beside open graves. Yet even in these hours of bitter anguish, let me see, in bitter anguish, I would still say to you, weep not. And I don't mean that you should not allow tears to have free course, but do not give way to frantic or despairing grief. Same thing when people don't come to the faith. It's okay to be heartbroken. We should be. It's okay to cry. In fact, we should. It's a valley of tears. People, people who are against um, emotions, you know, it's more of their personal disposition. They can wrap that up with their own little press secretary saying, no, it's my philosophical position. <laughs> Maybe, right? There, there are those people that are like, it's like, you know, Beavis and Butthead, you know, they, they're told not to laugh for a day and they're really struggling, you know, and they're, they're hearing things that make them want to laugh. It's kind of like this with the, the real stoic person that's like, I never have my emotions. And inside they're like, oh, that one really hit. I was watching Dar Man. <laughs> I was watching Dar Man recently with that autistic kid. And, I just <laughs> and you're looking at their face you're like, dude, your veins are popping out of your head. I know. <laughs> Stop staring. Strive rather to let your attitude as you stand beneath your cross resemble that of the mother of Jesus when she stood uh, beneath the cross of her beloved son. Yeah. A desolate mother, and this is a great story. A desolate mother knelt beside the grave of her darling, her only child, a boy, 10 years old. She knelt thus for hours until she was almost blinded by her tears and her voice was choked with sobs. And yet, as the poet tells us, although we part with tears and pain from those who hold our love, we know we'll find them all again in the fields of light above. Assuredly, that is not dead which the grave enfolds. This can be true not only of our physical death, but when you look at the world and you see the world and you say, man, the world is gone. The world is toast. Everything's for naught. There's no hope. We're left with nothing but just hoping that maybe one day the skies will open up like scrolls and our Lord will come down on a white horse and take care of the business because it's so bad. And I say, he's on a white horse right now inside of you. And he's saying, charge. He's saying, do it with all your might. Subject those things to Christ the King. Be courageous. Be valiant. Let the scroll of your heart open wide and let that horseman come through. An interior voice tells us this, making itself heard by all nations, causing them to hold in honor and reverence the last resting places of the departed. Yes, it's true. It's also why not only that we should be okay at the deathbed, but we should also at the deathbed of society in the world that when we see this world, and it looks like a grave that we say everybody around the world, they're still putting together these, these, <laughs> these beautiful uh, graveyards. They're still putting them together. They're still going and putting flowers there for the dead. Why? Even, even, the, even the people who are unbelievers will go and they will put flowers on that grave. Why? Because there is a hope within the world crying out for the sons and the daughters of God. Even the most uncultured nations entertain the hope 
that the sleep of death is not eternal sleep, but that an awakening will come someday, in part because there's a cry there that says, we need a savior. We can sacrifice the animals. We can sacrifice the kids. Sacrifice human life, the, the gem of all creation. We can sacrifice those things, and yet we are completely burdened with our sins. Nothing can spare us. Please help. whether in this life, in fact, or even the next, that there's something inside that says, I, it has to be more. There has to be a reward for trying my best. There has to be a, a reward for those who lived wicked lives and did nothing but hurt people. Right here. Let's see. Can it be possible that the human form, the fairest flower, right? The fairest of flowers, that wondrous fabric, that marvelous microcosm is doomed to lie forever in the grave to remain forever what death has made it, namely a decaying and repulsive corpse, a mere heap of dust and ashes. No, thus it cannot, thus it will not. There must assuredly be a resurrection that's part of Paleocrat's wager, not just about death, physical death. I have to believe this, by the way, about death. I must, in fact, see my daughter again. It is a driving force. I must see her once again dancing. I must see her singing. See her in those celestial skates. Cancer and carefree. Smiling up at our Lord and our Lady. I must. But I look at the I look at society and I say the same. I look at the unbeliever, the, the people in my own life, my friends who've fallen away from faith, from faith, my family members. I have family members who've walked away from God. I look at them and I say, I have to believe that there will come a day where they are going to rise, that, that the, the wooden nails of those coffins cannot hold them down. And why? Because it didn't hold down the King of Kings, that tomb. That stone that was rolled in front of the tomb, it could not contain him. Let those unbelievers press that ball down beneath that water. Watch what God can do. Watch what God can do. And in many cases, through you. Calling you to that place. Not to the best argument in the world but to that confession line with them, to your knees in prayer at home, to that place where you're helping those in need, where you're praying like the wolf pack for other people who say, please pray for me, and you're doing more than likes and prayers. The world can see through that. You must, in fact, do much more. You must, in fact, Never give way to frantic grief, but weep as a Christian ought. When the heart's most poignant grief and bitter tears has found relief, then the mourner first most truly feels he's not dead, whom now the grave conceals. Tis sweet, as year by year we lose, friends out of sight, by faith to muse, how grows in paradise our store. Yes, look at the way that we look at death. How can you say, how can the unbeliever, we, we pulled the rug out from them. They say, you fear death, and you go, how can I possibly fear death? You cannot say that I fear death and I want to die. You cannot say this. Well, you just want to die. You know what martyrdom is. You're always talking about wanting to die. You just want people to die. You don't want to provide relief to them through socialistic schemes. You just want people to die. And yet, they're saying, you're so terrified of death that you create this thing all around you. What a funky, what a funky argument that is. And yet, we know year by year, we're losing our friends, we're losing our family, we're all growing old. I started realizing not long ago, I've got white hair big time on the side of my head. 
It's not just short, it's white. I've got it in my beard in certain parts. I got Rand McNally uh, map atlas lines of roads on the side of my face when I smile. I'm getting older. And so are you every day. And one day, in fact, we'll die. And yet, and yet we are encouraged. And this is the last, the last frame. The last one. Spread thy wings and boldly fly. Courage raises to the sky. When afflictions fierce assail, never let thy courage fail. Hottest fire, refiners say, melts the gold and hardens clay. Remember this. Remember this in your life, right? Remember this when the things get tough. The hottest fire. Bring it on. And know that, that having that heart inside, having that heart and that resolve of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to say, you know what? We believe that God can save us from this. We believe that he can save us from this crazy furnace that you've constructed to throw us in. And we've watched other people die. We've heard their, their screams and their cries. But even if he doesn't, we're never going to kneel to you. We have a hope in a redeemer. And we can say now, looking back at Golgotha, looking back at Calvary, we can say, I know this because he died. And moreover yet, because he rose from the grave. All right. Love you guys. Love you guys. I'm sorry I didn't get to the comment section. I apologize for that. I, <laughs> I'm bummed that I started the music. I'm not going to stop it. I'm not going to stop it. I'm really sorry, though, that I didn't get to that. Make sure, look, if you want to talk to us and you want to make sure that we're all in this together, go to the, the description below this video right now. We've got links for the Wolfpack chat. Okay? We've got links for that. You can share MP3s, PDFs. You can share videos, links, you can share uh, memes, GIFs, or GIFs. I think it's GIFs personally, but you know, whatever. <laughs> but happy fun times and prayer requests. Prayer requests. And we really pray. Put us to the test. Go and check it out yourself. See if what we're saying is true. See if what we're saying is true. See how we live with the joy in our heart while also recognizing the painful things that we're asking prayers for. And why? Because we're putting this stuff right here to action. We're applying these truths. We're not just sitting there saying, well, yeah, it does say that, but I don't know if I can do that. No, we know we can. We know we can. We have, we have a role to play, but we ain't giving up. And why is that? Because we resolve to a number of things here. There are rules, in fact. They're the basic, the basic premise of what we do. Take a knee for Jesus every day, right? Never give up, keep on smiling, memento mori. Be there for the wolf pack. Be there for your neighbors. Love God with everything you've got. I know you're going to die. Of course, make sure. Let's see here. Make sure to go to samemaker.com slash Diaries. I'll be back uh, Friday, 11 o'clock. It's going to be a whole bunch of fun. Uh, thank you for joining us. Hope to see you in the wolf pack chat on Telegram. And until next time, never give up. Keep on smiling. And momentum more. I wanted to make people dream bigger thoughts.